I'm going to tell you a story today, and the story is about how our understanding of stars, their age, their structure, their evolution, has been revolutionized over the last decade or so, primarily through the work of several satellites, two in particular that I'll discuss, that are allowing us to look at them in ways that were simply impossible until the last few years. So let me start with this picture of the Earth from space, and behind it the Milky Way, the way we all wish we could see it if we didn't have all the lights around. You see lots of little dots out there, and those are stars that are local, that are relatively nearby. And then you also see in the background the light of all the stars that are farther away blending together to make the Milky Way, which of course is our galaxy just seen from the inside. Some of the dots that you see are actually other galaxies, but they're so far away they just look like stars to us. We can't tell the difference between them and the local stars. So what happens, you might ask, if you get a big telescope, a really big telescope, and you look at the stars? What do they look like in those? Well, the answer is they still look like little dots. So a good question to ask yourself might be, how do we know anything about the stars at all when all we see when we look at them is these tiny little dots? And that's a really long story with a long history. And I'm only going to touch on the most recent aspects of that here. But before I even do that, another question you might want to ask yourself is, why should I care? Why does it matter what the stars are? So let me try to address that from a couple of different points of view, and maybe one of them will appeal to you. Here's the way people looked at the stars a long time ago. They looked at the stars and they saw stories. The stories were different in different cultures, so not every culture saw the lizard and the lyre or the swan and the fox. Cultures made their own stories up. Maybe the stories still fascinate you. Maybe you still find them interesting. Lots of us do, and that might be a reason to care about the stars. We still tell stories about the stars, only our stories are more science-based now than they were in the old days, but they're still stories. By the way, you should notice something in this, which is that little circle that I put up there surrounding an apparently empty space on this uh, star chart between the swan and the lyre, and kind of keep that in your mind's eye a little bit, because we're going to come back to that a little bit later, and it's going to turn out to be important in a modern way as well. Maybe your interests are more with human beings. In that case, maybe it would be interesting you to know that almost all of the elements that make up us, human beings, and all the things that we work with, other than hydrogen and helium, were made inside stars, and many of them inside these giant explosions that we call supernovae, which represent the deaths of stars 10 or more times the mass of the sun. So knowing where we come from and what makes us up might be another reason that you would care about what the stars are. Maybe your interests are in planets. It's a beautiful one or maybe a planet that's a lot closer to home, and it's a little more familiar to us. Or maybe because you read the news and you read the stories that are in the press, your interests are planets around other stars, exoplanets or extrasolar planets. Whichever ones you might be interested in, keep in mind that we can't understand the planets without understanding the stars that they orbit because both form together out of the same cloud of gas and dust. So understanding our history and our connection to the universe is another reason to care about stars. So the missions I want to talk a little bit about today, or the data I'm going to talk about today, come primarily from two missions, a European mission called CORO, which stands for Convection, and Rotation, Convection, Rotation, and Transits. It's a European mission launched in 2006. And the Kepler mission, which is a NASA mission launched in 2009. Uh, Kepler stared at this particular little patch of sky for four years or so. I'm circling it there. And if you think back just a little bit, you'll recognize that that patch of sky is exactly the same patch of sky that I showed on that old star chart. So there is kind of a connection between the old stories and the new stories. The function of Kepler, the primary mission of Kepler, and the reason you might have heard of it, was that it was to look for exoplanets, to look for planets around other stars. And I'm going to digress for just a second and tell you how it did that. So the way Kepler did this is it looked at this little patch of sky it looked at about 150,000 stars at once in this little patch of sky for more than four years, and the goal was to look for transits. Transits happen when a planet in orbit around its star passes between us and that star. And when that happens, the star looks a little bit fainter. How much? Well, if the planet's like Jupiter, which is a pretty big planet by our solar system standards, it's about a 1% drop in the light. And if the planet is like the Earth, which is pretty insignificant on astronomical scales, it's only one one hundredth of a percent of the drop. So it's a really small signal. But if you get above the Earth's turbulent atmosphere and you look from space, you can see this. And Kepler's been successful at finding thousands of planets. 
And I should say, because we're going to see them again, that this kind of graph, which plots brightness against time, is called a light curve. But this isn't a talk about planets, it's a talk about stars. So let me show you first this notional drawing of what a star is. We have one really close by, so maybe it's familiar. So you see on the outside sunspots. You see these things called prominences. Astronomers are very original and creative in their naming. Uh, they're called prominences because they're prominent against the limb of the sun. Prominences are these magnetic field-supported structures of hot gas sticking out from the sun. Something you don't see in this picture is the corona, or I'm sorry, the solar wind, which is this outflowing, really hot, million-degree gas that's flowing out from the sun in all directions. You can see the core, which is basically a giant fusion reaction turning hydrogen into helium and releasing the energy that powers the sun. You can see inside that there's a part which is uh, dominated by energy train being transported outward primarily by radiation called the radiative zone. And you can see a part where energy is being transported outward primarily by convection. And now you already know how creative astronomers are, so you can guess what the name of that one is. But how do we know all of this? And a lot more besides. And if I had given this talk 15 years ago, the answer would have been something like this. We think we understand the physics that makes up stars, that governs how they operate. So we build a computer model of a star, and we make that model look like the sun or a star on the outside. So it's as bright as the sun, and it's as hot as the sun. And we figure that since we know the physics, and we know what it looks like on the outside, when the model fits, it probably looks like our model on the inside. Now, you could imagine there might be problems with that approach. Maybe we can do it a little bit better. And it turns out that all the same properties that make Kepler so great for looking for planets, that is, it's able to look at lots of stars and see these tiny little changes in the light from them, that also makes it really, really good for learning about stars. So let me start with this picture. We're going to start with a star we know best, which is the sun. So I, I call this stellar or solar dermatology because we're looking at the outside. So a picture of the whole disk of the sun. And the picture is dominated, of course, by the big disk. That's the most obvious feature. But the other thing that you see are these dark spots, these sunspots. These are actually areas where the magnetic field of the sun is strong. And so the hot gas that's trying to rise to the surface has some trouble getting there. So it's a little bit cooler and therefore a little bit darker. And if you look at these things up close, it becomes even more obvious that, one, they're beautiful, and two, they're dominated by magnetic fields. If I put that image of the sun there in motion, I made it. Uh, made a movie out of it, you'd see the spots going across the disk of the sun. And that's not because the spots are moving, but it's because the sun is rotating. And so we watch the spots kind of go around and around as the sun rotates. In the case of the sun, it takes about a month to go around, a little bit less than that. So Kepler allows us to see this in other stars, not just the sun. So here's, I apologize, I'm showing you data. But data is cool. So bear with me a little bit, and I'll try to explain. So we've got a plot here, which is a light curve, just like the one we saw before. Now, two stars observed with Kepler. What you're seeing on the horizontal axis is time. It's got a funny name because it's funny astronomer days, but it's really just think of it as days. And then on the vertical axis, you're seeing changes in brightness. And it's scaled so that the 0.01 that you see is a 1% change. So the first thing that you should see on this, of the three things I'm going to point out, is that the stars are changing in brightness. And they're changing in brightness by about a percent, or a little bit less. And that is the sp sunspots, or as we properly should call them, star spots, on these stars going past. The second thing that you probably noticed on this are all these spikes all over the place. And what those are represent are actually flares on these stars, so stellar flares like the solar flares that we have on our sun, only these are a lot bigger. They can be as much as 3% of the light output of the entire star in this one flare. The third thing you should notice, which you may have noticed already, is that the star's brightness goes up and down and up and down and up and down, but it doesn't do it randomly. It does it periodically. So the one on top goes up and down about four times a day. The one on the bottom goes up and down a little more often than once a day. And what we're seeing there is the rotation of these stars as they turn. Just like in the case of the sun, we'd see the spots go back and forth. So when the spot comes across, the star gets a little bit fainter. These stars, in particular, rotate a lot faster than the sun does. Something else you might notice if you look closely is that the star on top, the one that's rotating faster, also has bigger wiggles in its light curve. And that's not a coincidence. 
what's happening is that deep inside these stars, there's a kind of electric motor called the dynamo, which creates the magnetic fields that make the spots that we see. So when we spin the star faster, we make more magnetic field and we get bigger spots. So typically, stars that rotate faster have bigger wiggles in their light curve. With Kepler, we don't have to look at just two stars, though. Remember, we've got all these stars to look at. We can look at 2,000 stars like the Sun and see this going on. So here, what you're seeing on the horizontal axis is rotation period. So the slow rotating stars are over on the right. And then the vertical axis is basically how big the wiggles are. So higher up means bigger wiggles. And you can see that as the stars rotate slower and slower, as we move to the right, they get less and less active. They get, the wiggles get smaller and smaller. That little box that's on the plot there is where the sun would live if we put it on this plot. So the, in this sense, the sun is a fairly typical kind of star, which might be reassuring. I don't know. There's something else we can learn from this, too, and that is the age of the star. So on this plot, which is, I think, the last one I'm going to show you that actually has, has horrible stuff on the axes, um, has age on the horizontal axis. So the older stars are to the right and then rotation period, how fast they go around on the vertical axis. So the, the thing to notice here is that the stars that are older rotate more slowly. And that's happening because of this wind, this solar wind, which on the stars is the stellar wind. We're very creative. Um, and that wind doesn't carry off a lot of mass, but it carries off momentum. And so as the star gets older, the wind carries away momentum, and the star spins slower and slower and slower and slower, kind of like we do. You might think, when you look at this, that there's a problem here, right? I have the age of these stars down on there. How, where did that come from? How do I figure out, how did I figure out the age of these things to put it on in the first place? And probably at this point, it won't surprise you too much to realize that Kepler helps us here too. So I showed you this notional picture of a star, the sun, before. Here's a different notional picture of a star. This is what it would look like if we could look really closely at the surface. And we would find that it's wobbling up and down. It's oscillating regularly. The oscillations aren't nearly as big as the, you see here. Uh, otherwise, we, you notice them every time you looked at the sun. So it's exaggerated so we can see it. But the idea is there. And coupled with the going up and down motion is a change in the brightness of the star. It's a very small change. In the case of the sun, it's a few parts in a million. And for stars that do this on large scales, it can be as big as a few parts per thousand. But still, it's something that's very hard to do from the ground. But spacecraft like Kepler let us do it from orbit. And the reason this matters is that the period, how long it takes for the star to do this, is different for different stars. For the sun, it's about every five minutes this happens. But for stars that are bigger than the sun, it takes longer. And for stars that are smaller than the sun, it happens faster. And so measuring this lets us figure out how big the star is. Now, like any kind of real science, it's, I, I just told a fairy tale, right? It's not really that simple. It's a little more complicated. So I showed you a star oscillating. But you could imagine other ways that a star might oscillate. And I'll, I'll put a few up there until it gets positively psychedelic and I can entrance you. <laughs> so real stars do this. They oscillate like all these pictures shown and a lot more besides. And they, they do them all at the same time. So if you wanted to imagine what the motion of the surface looks like, imagine in your mind adding all four of these together at the same time and it gets rather complicated. So when we look at real stars, it's a little more, a little more difficult to understand. But let me try to simplify it a little bit. So here's a, here's a plot, a bunch of lines, a forest of lines. So we're comparing two stars here. On the bottom is the sun, our favorite star. And on the top is Alpha Centauri, which is the closest neighbor to the sun, beloved of science fiction for a long time. Alpha Centauri looks a lot like the sun. That's one of the things that fascinates science fiction writers about it, because it, it's our nearest neighbor and it's not too different from the sun. So what do those little forests of lines mean? Well, each line represents one way in which the star is oscillating. So one of those, say, four that I showed you before. The heights of the lines are proportional to how big the oscillations are. So you can see one thing. There are lots of oscillations going on. But something else that you can notice here is that there's a lot of complexity here, but it's really easy to tell the difference between the sun and Alpha Centauri. So even though they look the same on the outside, they're not the same on the inside. And by looking at the oscillations, we can immediately tell that really easily. And Kepler lets us do this for lots of different stars. So here's a collection of stars like the sun. And as you move down the graph, you can see the little forest of lines moving to the left, to the left, to the left, to the left. And that's telling us that these stars are all different from one another, despite the fact that they look the same on the outside. Now, there's something else we can learn here. By looking at the details of how this little forest of lines is distributed, we can learn the composition. 
In particular, we can learn how much helium there is. Why does that matter? Well, remember that the star is a furnace. It's turned nuclear furnace. It's turning hydrogen into helium. So by comparing how much helium there is deep inside to how much helium there is at the surface, we can figure out how long the furnace has been running and how old the star is. And that's what lets us calibrate that plot that I showed you before of rotation against age. We can only do this for the brightest stars, but once we've calibrated that rotation relationship, now we have access to all sorts of other stars. So I kind of touched on a little bit of the, the revolution that's taken place in our understanding of stars um, in the last decade or so. Um, as I said, I think it's important because stars are kind of what couple us to the universe. Um, our planet and the way we live and everything about our lives wouldn't be here without the sun, so it's important to understand that if we want to understand our connection to the rest of the universe. Now, it's going to change. Things are going to change in the next decade as well. Um, the Europeans have just launched this Gaia mission, which will look at about a billion stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. NASA will be launching in the next few years a mission called TESS, which is going to look at stars that are nearby and bright, but we, but we already know have planets around them, and it's going to look at them very closely. So the talk that I'm giving today is very different than the one I would have given 10 years ago. My guess is the talk that I would give 10 years from now is going to be just as different from the one uh, that I'm giving today. So kind of watch this space and stay tuned, and thank you very much.